With the release of macOS Big Sur, Apple has shown us the direction in which they want to take the Mac over the next few years. So in today's video, we're gonna break down the important changes, new tools, and useful features. Let's jump into it. This video is sponsored by Anchor, America's number one USB charging brand that offers a wide range of chargers, power banks, computer interface devices, and more. The new Anchor Nano is here and it offers extremely fast 20 watt charging in a tiny package. This is the 20 watt brick that Apple charges $20 for and doesn't include with the iPhone. And here is the 20 watt Anchor Nano. It's just one inch cubed and weighs the same as a AA battery. Plus, it uses USB Type-C for compatibility across a wide range of devices. And if you need a little more power, Anchor also offers the 60-watt two-port wall charger with a slim, ultra-portable design and support for simultaneous laptop and mobile charging. Both the Nano and the wall charger use Anchor's patented PowerIQ fast charging technology that works across most phones and electronic devices. And the wall charger uses extremely advanced gallium nitride technology technology for incredibly fast performance in a slim and tiny package. If you're interested in learning more about Anchor's patented fast charging technology or you want to buy the Anchor Nano, check out the links in the description below. So the first thing that you probably want to know about macOS Big Sur is if your Mac is supported. Well, here is a list of all of the compatible models. The first thing you'll want to make note of is if you have a MacBook Pro, you're going to need a late 2013 model, not an early 2013 model. For iMacs, weirdly enough, you will need a 2014 or later. I'm not entirely sure why the late 2013 iMac was excluded. I've got one behind me and it is perfectly capable of running modern operating systems, certainly more powerful than a mid-2013 MacBook Air, and yet the Air runs Big Sur and that iMac does not. But apart from that little discrepancy, this is basically what you would expect from Apple, so any Mac that's up to six or seven years old will work with Big Sur. And because I know you're wondering, I did run Big Sur for a little while on the base model mid-2013 MacBook Air, the least powerful device on the list, and it runs without any issue. So don't worry about performance on older devices. When you install macOS Big Sur, you'll notice right away that this is the biggest visual overhaul since Yosemite back in 2014. It might take a little bit of getting used to, but most of what you expect to find in macOS is still here. Mission Control and Launchpad function the same as before. You still have the same menu items and dock options. What certainly has changed in terms of functionality is Notification Center. There's a whole new UI here centered around widgets, which adopt a lot of the same visual characteristics as iOS 14. We also have this new pane here that allows us to configure and select various widgets, just like you would on iOS. And just like on iOS, third-party developers will be able to create widgets that go here, so you will have a lot more options for customization and utility. Also, just like iOS, you can resize the widgets, so if you right-click, you can choose a small or a medium size and tile them to your liking. This is definitely a sign that Apple is intent on making the transition between iPhones, iPads, and MacBooks as seamless as possible and having all of the applications essentially be cross-compatible. And so that's why you can see the widgets on macOS are almost identical to the widgets on iOS. Above the widgets, you'll find notifications that look very similar to the ones in iOS, including grouping up by type and expanding when you click on them. And while we're on the subject of things that look very similar to iOS, let's talk about Control Center, because this, this is a weird one. There's a completely new design with a suspiciously touchscreen friendly interface and a few hidden features. For example, upon first glance, you might think that the giant brightness and sound sliders are unnecessary, but you can actually click on them to open sub menus with additional features. We've got toggles for dark mode, which we can turn off right from here without having to open system preferences, as well as enabling night shift and true tone. 
There's a surprising amount of functionality and redundancy built into this control center. For example, we can change airdrop settings right from here. We can also change Bluetooth settings and pick devices to connect to, even though there's another Bluetooth menu bar that you can add that is exactly the same. But why clutter up your menu bar with another pesky icon, right? You could just do it straight from the control center. Similarly, just like iOS, there's a tiny little music pane that allows you to scrub around as well as skip through songs, just like you would find on iOS. One that I especially like is the little tab that allows you to adjust the keyboard brightness. This is great if you have a touch bar Mac, because if you want to change the keyboard backlight on that, normally you got to click the little arrow and then it expands out the full menu because the function keys don't exist anymore. So this makes it a little bit easier to do that. A lot of this is very similar to iOS, which I think is actually a good thing. You know, we, we can make fun of Apple for sort of unifying their operating system, but a lot of these are things that I really enjoy on iOS and feel right at home on the Mac. And particularly with the new control center, it's really nice to not have to go digging through system preferences or a bunch of different menu bar items to access these simple controls. Also, pro tip, you can use two finger scrolling on the sliders so you don't have to click and drag the mouse across the screen like a peasant. There are also changes made to the way that windows look in Big Sur. The best example of this is in Finder. You can see that we've gotten rid of the gray top bar, instead going for a simple white look with just some clean iOS-esque icons here. And on the side, we have a full height translucent bar. This is sort of the visual identity that carries across many of Apple's own applications, such as iMessage, Maps, Reminders, Notes, and Music. Less redesigned but much improved nonetheless is Safari, and there are a ton of new features here. Not only do we get a powerful new privacy feature that not only is extremely aggressive at blocking ad trackers and disguising personal information, but it'll also let you see all of that data. We also get a new favorites page with redesigned groupings and a lot more utility. There are customizable groupings of bookmarks, favorites, reading lists, and even a privacy report that summarizes the measures Safari is taking to protect you online. To the left of the search bar, there's this new little badge icon, and if you click on that, you can see all of the different trackers that Safari prevents from profiling you on each website that you visit. Sometimes you will be legitimately blown away by how many of these ad trackers there are. I think the peak that I got was like, 240 on a uh, somewhat sketchy news site. And if we click this little eye icon here, you can pull up the full report, the same one that you'll find on the, uh, the favorites page. And this shows you everything that it's preventing from tracking the websites that have trackers, as well as the common websites, as well as common trackers across all the different websites you visit. So this is a really good way to find out what exactly is going on behind the scenes when you're browsing the web. But who cares about privacy and security when you can care about this? Check out this little menu here at the bottom right. This allows you to see a whole bunch of different things that you can configure, but more importantly, you can now set a background for Safari. You know, like the thing that's been on Google Chrome for about 150 years. Oh man, how cool is that? These backgrounds look so cool. Ooh, look at that, it's got like a little hippo. Also useful are tab thumbnails, which show up when you hover over the tab. These are particularly useful if you're a tab hoarder and you always end up with teeny tiny little tabs where you can't even read the label on them. Although you're probably gonna need a decent amount of RAM because it's gonna have to cache the thumbnails. By far and away, my favorite new feature in Safari is finally 4K YouTube playback. That's right, we did it everyone. We finally got them to do it. Yes, yes, yes. I have been waiting for so long to be able to do this. Ugh, it's absolutely glorious. Finally, I don't have to open Chrome when I'm watching YouTube in high resolution. Not that I have a problem with Chrome, I just, I kind of prefer Safari to be honest. I might get crucified for saying that, but I do, I prefer Safari. But Safari is not the only app to receive a major overhaul in Big Sur. Here are a couple of other ones. Message allows you to pin conversations just like on iOS, and there's also easier photo integration that allows you to pull from your library a lot more easily. And now you can also pop conversations out into a separate window if you wanna have multiple open at the same time. 
Maps has a cleaner layout now with that unified sidebar design, and you can now create guides. So this one, for example, which I made in Washington DC, this would be great if you were planning a travel itinerary. You know, when, when we can actually travel again in about 35 million years, it feels like. Now, while it might not be a tip or a trick per se, macOS Big Sur also comes with an army of new sounds. They definitely take a little bit of getting used to, but they're growing on me. I especially like the sound when you trash something, when you empty the trash, and when you move a file. They're a lot of fun. Here are some other examples of the new sounds in macOS Big Sur. So what do you think? Are the new sounds better or worse than they were before? Let me know in the comments below. But one thing you cannot dispute is that the return of the startup chime is glorious. And in fact, this isn't exactly the same startup chime as we've had since 1998. It is subtly tweaked and sounds a little bit more retro and it is awesome. So while macOS Big Sur is a transformational operating system, they haven't sacrificed the core of what macOS is. That I think is really important. For the past couple of years, people have been fearing that iPads and Macs were just merging into the same thing. And while it's true that Apple brought a lot of things from iOS and iPad OS into macOS, they haven't compromised the core of what makes this a Mac experience. The dock, the menu, swiping, launchpad, multi-touch controls, multiple desktops, all of that is almost entirely unchanged except for the visuals, the aesthetics. And that is really, really important because it proves that Apple is committed to the Mac experience. They're not just trying to make this into an iPad. Although to my grave, I will maintain that the new control center looks like it was built for a touchscreen. I don't know if we'll ever get a touchscreen Mac, but I swear I'm not the only one that thinks that. So that's an overview of the big stuff, the new features in macOS Big Sur. Let me know in the comments below which feature you think is your favorite. Also, let me know if there was anything that I didn't talk about that you've discovered while using the public beta or the release version of Big Sur. Let me know all of that stuff in the comments below. And as usual, if you liked the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Please consider following me on Twitter at Luke Miani and check out my Twitch channel and my subreddit, which are linked in the description below. And with that, I will see you all in the next video.